I want to welcome all of you, welcome you back if you're um, an alumna, alumnus, an alumni, and um, welcome parents and students. There's a big, big range of, of personalities here to the Chicago Language Center. My name is Katherine Bauman. I'm the um, current director. I was just appointed in September the director of the Chicago Language Center. Thank you very much. My previous post was um, and I, a job that I'm still um, engaged in is the director of the German language program. And I'll say a little bit more about what that is in a few minutes. Um, we teach, we have, I've been able to document the teaching of 85 languages here at the University of Chicago. This academic year we're teaching 57. And so I thought instead of asking you which languages you think we're teaching, it might be more interesting to ask you to guess which languages we're not teaching out of 87. Or 85. Anyone want to throw any? We teach Sanskrit. We teach Swahili. We do not teach Hmong. We teach Haitian Creole. Yeah. Other. We're weak in Southeast Asia. We do not teach Hmong or Vietnamese or Laotian or Cambodian. Cambodian. But our, we have um, consortial schools that do. Other guesses? Uh, we do not teach Tagalog. No. Good. So, yes, that's what, yeah. So anyway, a, a huge array of languages, modern languages, also um, ancient languages. And it's, uh, I, would, I would say that um, language teaching, the study of language, whether it was you're studying the language itself, whether you're studying um, language as a means of inquiry, our, our linguistic students who must study a non-Western language as part of their linguistics, um, training language as a means to access culture, or access media, access history. So students who are studying film or studying history who need, who want to learn a language to get at, be able to get at that stuff more intensively or as a means to access, I would say, the broadest possible array of primary and secondary literature. A lot of, of the teaching we do is teaching reading, whether it's reading an ancient language or graduate courses, reading the modern languages for graduate students, where there's a huge array of language teaching done here and really um, as a scholarly pursuit really supporting the other st all of the study in especially in the humanities division although we of course have many students from the social sciences and other divisions. Um, Goethe said he who knows no foreign languages knows nothing of his own and I think this is especially pertinent for native speakers of English that knowing another language or another having access to another language and culture helps you understand not just your own language, but your own culture. And in fact, I think that's um, especially important for Americans to be able to understand the position and the cultural position of the United States in the world, since we have so much power. Um, my goal today is to introduce you to the Chicago Language Center. And um, it's, it's, I would claim it's an intellectual space to accomplish all of the goals of teaching that I just mentioned. But it's also a physical space that I like to think um, embodies Louis Sullivan's uh, adage, form following function. And that evolved very specifically several years ago when the center was designed and opened up. It opened in winter quarter in 2007. Um, it was really designed with the needs of language learners and language teachers in mind, ne space, media, multimedia, um, needs for teachers, needs for learners, needs uh, for their intern we, we took com consideration into consideration some of the role of the registrar um, at that time the needs of commonly taught languages the needs of less commonly taught languages or even least commonly taught languages on campus um, interestingly enough um, well a committee was formed in 2005 at that time we had a couple of different um, resource areas on campus one called the language faculty resource center down on the, um, the end of this, the other end of this hallway, which is now the main uh, area of the Chicago Language Center. That was primarily a fa facility where I would go to make photocopies and to borrow equipment like video players or monitors or tape players or whatever I needed to use any kind of multimedia in my class. It was also an area, it had been around um, for a long time, Chicago was and is a member of the Consortium for Language Teaching and Learning. That's a Mellon funded, was a Mellon funded um, group of the Ivy's, what we call the Ivy Plus institutions, 10 institutions. And we did, we had consortial 
projects in professional development and materials development across those 10 institutions. Um, that organization has now been reconfigured into a, um, a nonprofit, still called the Consortium for Language Teaching and Learning. But the, the money, there was seed money, and there still is seed money on campus for language teachers to do materials development and other projects. So we also needed, um, there was a development space in the old Language Fac Faculty Resource Center. So if you needed to work with video or work with any kind of materials you needed to manipulate. So, and, and then the other facility was a language labs and archives in the basement of the social science building where students would go and listen to tapes, primarily one function, the other being an archive from, from primarily from linguistics research of tapes and other um, collections of some indigenous languages, a huge actually collection of digital, re well tape recordings now being digitized of um, indigenous languages. So what happened was that in, it was, when I think back, it's almost like a miracle <laughs> sometimes. In 2005, a committee was formed with a representative from each of the language departments on campus to look at these two facilities, the Language Faculty Resource Center and the Language Lags and Archives, and think about the role those played and what we needed going forward. Thinking, thinking of all the ways that language was taught and learned and pursued as, a, as, a, as an intellectual pursuit on this campus. That committee was made up, as I said, of representatives across all the languages, but because of a, a restructuring and a reevaluation of the language um, curriculum and requirement through another um, Mellon grant, um, a couple, about a decade and a half before that, there, was, there were new, new individuals on campus, I being one of them, language program coordinators. So this was a relatively new development in the middle of the 1980s where big language departments with graduate programs began to recognize the need to have a teaching specialist running the language program. So here at Chicago, like at many other graduate programs in the country, graduate students come to do their, pursue their intellectual, critical, literary interests, but they also need to, be de need to develop their skills as language teachers. Because when they go out into the job market, not only are they going to be able to teach a course on modernist poetry, they're also probably going to have to teach second year German or first year German language. So um, my, my, that is my role in the German department. I teach the grad students how to be language teachers, and I design all the curriculum in the language program. And then they work for me as teachers. That's also part of their support package. They also design their own courses and teach them. And I'm with them every step of the way, developing their portfolio as language instructors. And since the um, late 90s at Chicago, several different individuals had been hired in that capacity, a colleague in Russian, a colleague in the Asian languages. I was hired. So we became part of this committee reassessing these two facilities for language um, resources. There were other things going on at that time. It was really a, a, a constellation of things happening all independently from each other that really led to the way our language center looks right now. One was that all the classrooms in Cobb were being renovated to be what we call now a smart classroom. That means they all have something that looks like this in them. Um, machines, now the video machines were just removed, actually, but they were um, devices that could play video, play tapes, play CDs, play DVDs that you could attach your computer to, and they all have screens in them, either big screens like this and a uh, projector or a big um, video or just a big, big monitor. So this completely erased the need for the LFRC to be renting that equipment. You know, we used to roll those videos through the, those monitors through the hallways. This just went away just like that because every single classroom is equipped this way. Um, another change is that publishers began putting their audio and video materials up online. And I can show you that, uh, just a very quick example. This is even predates um, what we would now have, which is the ebook, which is the whole, the whole entire textbook is available online. So for example, these are the audio uh, materials that I would use to teach. Um, these are materials that are part that, that I would use when I'm teaching um, my class. These are 
go along with activities in the textbooks. So I bring, I don't need to bring a tape player and a tape or a CD. I don't need to rewind it or wind it or find it or skip through. I just go and I click on the right link. And it works, I hope. Let's see. Here we go. Situation 13. Dialog auf dem Rathaus. Melanie Steiger ist auf dem Rathaus in Regensburg. Okay. Um, not just audio materials, also um, video materials or transparencies. So these are uh, visual materials that are available uh, that are in the textbook. And if I want to use them to do something in class and I want to have them up on a screen, now I have the, the students have them available in their books. But if I want to do some, something else with them, I have them now available and I can use them with students, use on any, click on any, there it is, and I can have students come up and point to things. If I project this on a white screen, I can have students write on it, you know, doing, whether getting up out of their seats. So the whole, the whole idea of, of how materials are available and where those materials are available also changed, and it also meant that students didn't need to go to a language lab anymore and sit in those carols. You know, in German it's called the Sprachlabor, the speaking laboratory, which rhymes with Schlaflabor, the sleeping <laughs> laboratory. We did a lot of Schlaf in the Labor because it was a pretty boring, you know, it's the end of the day and you didn't really want to be there. But now students can access those materials anytime, anywhere on their computers. They're usually doing it in their rooms at about four o'clock in the morning. We can actually look, you can actually look online and see when students are accessing material. But the point being that they don't have to all be doing it in one place at one time. They also don't, they can do it whenever they want, as much as they want, which is a tremendous advantage because you might need to look at those materials for 15 minutes, you might need 35 minutes. And so now individual learners can access materials and work with materials and it it's begins to shift the way those materials work. Yes? Yeah, I always thought one of the advantages of the language lab was hearing your voice versus you know, right, but you can, voice. but you can do that on the lang in language in a lot of materials now. You can play something. You can interject yours in the middle. You can hear it again. You can even create a little tape. You can even there are even programs where you can speak into the program and see see a um, linguistic picture of your voice. I mean, it's incredible what's available. Now, this is something you buy. Uh, this comes automatically with the textbook. With the textbook. Yeah. This is all of it. The students have access as part of the textbook package. It's all available to them. But any of you that have studied languages either recently or a long time ago, if you just Google German language materials or French language materials, you will find hundreds and hundreds of free online activities to practice language. And I won't give my little soapbox um, statement about Rosetta Stone, which is very um, out of date pedagogy and not worth whatever price. Sorry if I'm stepping on any toes. But there's so many materials available out there that are very much more interactive. So, yes? Does this speed up the length of time that it would take for someone to learn or to start a language? Do you see that? I mean, do you have any? Yes, that's an excellent question. And what this, what this kind of access and the way that students are, avail uh, are able to work with materials online, and there's there are also, um, there are also, um, Let's see if I can get out of here. This is a PowerPoint. There are also, let's see, I'll choose chapter. Vocabulary activities, grammatical activities. There's an online workbook that students can all do on their own and get immediate feedback instead of writing out some activities, handing them to me, and maybe getting them back a day and a half or two days later. So this is what's, this is the, um, the availability of this kind of materials is, is leading to what's called being called the flipped classroom, where we really have to rethink what we're doing in the classroom when I have all of you here with me and what students can better do on their own and bring that practice and knowledge to the classroom so I can do something with them that they can't do on their own. And it is accelerating how much they can learn. So we really, really they, they can, in fact, there's a, um, a gentleman at Texas doing what he calls intensive learning, where he has the students commit to doing two or three hours of work per day or every other day, different online materials, and then they're, so they're really getting four contact hours per meeting day, 
and they're, they're making tremendous progress with language and learning, yes, exactly as you suggest, learning them more quickly, reaching higher levels of proficiency more quickly. So this is what stands now, is what is available to us. And so the other thing we thought about with the language center is what kind of space do we need for teaching and learning? You know, what kind, now that the materials are available this way, how do we want to use these materials? What, what do we need? What kind of facility do we need for those? Another issue that was going on at the time we were re-evaluating the role of the language center and the other facilities was that, was that there was a classroom crunch because they were slowly um, but steadily increasing the size of the undergraduate college and building Booth. Booth was not yet finished and um, another building and so we had a tremendous classroom crunch and there just weren't enough classrooms for a lot of our courses and we had a lot of languages with only three or four or five students and many classrooms that held 18 or 20 or 30. So we in our thinking about our language center space also thought about what kind of space we needed and we knew we needed really flexible space not just because of the different sizes of a language classroom but because of things students would be doing one-on-one -on -one or in small groups or that we might want to be doing with students in small groups. And then also this, this shift, this um, pedagogical shift to the, to, the, um, to the flipped classroom, to really considering what you're doing in the classroom. And for me, frankly, it's also a question of, it's a green question. Because if I have to bring all my students to campus, they're all using, or many students are using carbon fuels to get here, and the space is being heated in some ways. So it really becomes a question of why do you need to bring everyone to the same space and the time that you spend together had better really be used in the most effective way. So um, it wasn't really our charge in this, in this part of this community to design a space, but we did actually, because we, we began to have, we visited some other language centers, both um, in cyberspace and we went actually physically to visit some other language centers. And we really began to have ideas about we, what, what we wanted our space to look, at, look like. And we um, created a proposal, and I'm gonna hand this out to you. Don't mind passing that around. We developed a proposal um, along with the design, a preliminary design, um, and our proposal was accepted. Um, the budget for it happened to come in under a certain um, level that made it a smaller project, and it was sort of fast-tracked through approval. It was approved and it was built. It was almost like, like I said, it was almost like a miracle. It kind of, it made me believe in committee work again because you're in a lot of committees in academia and um, sometimes you really wonder what's going to come of those. And so the Language Center was opened in the winter quarter 2007. Um, on the flip side of the handout I just gave you, you can see a diagram of the entire second floor of Cobb Hall and see all the different spaces that we have um, to work with here. So back to, my, back to my claim about form following function. And I, I think I w the, what I'd like to stress to you is that this space, as you see it configured here, um, reflects sort of three primary um, considerations. One is that the, um, the Language Center is a public square, if you will, or a hub for everybody teaching language on campus. Uh, we're a campus where many, many, I would say, I would say the majority, well, easily the majority and probably 95% of everyone teaching language is either a senior lecturer, as I am, or a graduate student. So we are not latter faculty, and there are also many departments where the person teaching language is the only person on campus teaching that language, especially for the least commonly taught languages. So the space of the Language Center create, created a public square for all of us to work together and exchange ideas and exchange materials. And that you see in the, um, in the area here. Could, would you hand me one of those? I gave away all my handouts. That you see here re reflected to the other end of the hall. We're going to walk down there together. We chose this circular model to be a welcoming that reflects welcome and access, lots of openings. Lots of ways to access things. This space is also a hub for professional development of language teachers, both language instructors, senior lecturers, and graduate students. So as I said, my role as the language program director in German is to develop 
the professional teaching skills of all the graduate students, to send them out into the job market with, as I say, a lot of pedagogical errors in their quiver. So they're really ready to um, take, take, go to those interviews well informed about language teaching. And so the Language Center becomes a hub for professional development. We offer workshops and going forward we'll offer actual classes. Um, I plan to offer a certificate in second language pedagogy that graduate students can earn by t doing a certain amount of professional development activities so that they're, really, they're ready to go out with those skills. The second consideration are flexible sp spaces, really flexible spaces, especially small spaces. Uh, many of uh, the language instructors don't have their own offices. Some graduate students don't have their own offices. Sometimes students need a place to meet together. Sometimes the language with only three or five students need to meet somewhere. And a, and a smaller space can be a better space um, for those meetings. Um, and also thinking about the way teachers and students are using materials, the way and really the ways that languages are taught and learned. And the third consideration is multimedia access. So what kind of access to media, multimedia do you need? I'm going to look at this room as a reflection of all of these considerations in just a second. So you need to have the access to the media and you need to have support close to you. And, and, and another thing I would like to add is that the media, excuse me, the technology, the multimedia should support the pedagogy, not the other way around. So you'll notice that I'm not using PowerPoint. I hate PowerPoint. PowerPoint doesn't serve my pedagogical needs. I did want to open up that website to show you how publishers are offering things online, but I don't let PowerPoint drive my teaching. But when I want to teach something in a certain way, I need to know what's available, what kind of multimedia, what kind of technology, what kind of hardware, what kind of software can help me do a better job. So that's another role of the Language Center, to have individuals there. So if someone goes and says, I'd like to, I'd like to have my students send me listening files. Um, the, my, the, the inaugural director of the Language Center, Stephen Clancy, developed a, um, an iPad app called Soliloquy, which, in which you could, um, I could create a small sound file. I could have three questions in German. Tell me what you do on the weekend. Tell me what you don't do on the weekend. Um, tell me how you plan your time on the weekend, basically practicing, you know, verbs, high frequency verbs. I can send that file to my students. They can listen to my first prompt. Then they can interject their answers in the middle. Then they can listen to my second prompt. And they can create one sound file where it's interjected. They can replay it. They can hear it. They can send it to me. I can listen to it. So he created that as a way to en enable someone to work with sound files. So if any instructor goes to the language and says, I want to do this, I want to use video clips, I'd like to have my students be able to self-correct things, whatever it is. We're there to serve as a resource to offer them two or three ways to do that. What, do you, what are your pedagogical goals? What language are you working with? Whatever, and to, and to show them the way forward. So um, let's just look at these rooms as an example of those three considerations. You're in rooms 201 C and B. A is behind that um, white wall. This space, which you can see on your, on your plan down here at the, um, in the upper left-hand corner, whoops, the yeah, upper left-hand corner, this was two classrooms originally. It, we, in the reconstruction, it was, it was created into this, this space. These walls completely go away. This can be a space of three rooms. It holds about 90 people, theater style. For big meetings, we hold a language symposium here. We, do that in collaboration with Northwestern University of Illinois, Chicago, and DePaul. It's our turn this spring. We can hold a big meeting in here, but it can also be made into three small rooms for groups of maybe 12 or 8. So again, reflecting the needs of language teachers um, and learners in terms of space. Um, in terms of um, the multimedia access, each one of these spaces has a smart component here where I can hook this up. There's another screen that comes down there. When, all, when the entire space is open, I can have three screens down showing three of the same thing so everyone can see it or three different things depending on what I want to do as an instructor. So the media is there. It's available to do what I need it to do. Um, we actually, uh, many of my colleagues, um, especially in the um, 
Arabic languages and um, the East Asian languages. They have three meetings a week um, with an instructor and then two other meetings with a language assistant who's doing different work with a smaller group of students. And then we needed many, many rooms for these smaller groups. And at the time when this classroom crunch was going on, we said to the registrar, and we said to the, the provost, if you let us create this space, we'll take a lot of pressure off the registrar because we've created so many small spaces for people to meet and that will provide more rooms. And in fact, the registrar is looking for, is looking at the rest of Cobb Hall. And I've asked if the big rooms downstairs, the traditional classroom, if, if, if a, just a divider could be put in place because if you can just, some, a lot of times for language courses, you can just take one room and make it into two. You're doubling your space and it's a, it's a better space for a language class that might only have 12 or 15 people in it. So thinking about what those spaces need to look like. Um, another thing you can see on this handout, we, we're not going to go in there, but on the other side of this hall from where we are here, there we, we created also out of one classroom a whole bunch of small office spaces and small classroom spaces where groups of two students or three students or uh, someone can hold their office hour, a graduate student who doesn't have their own office. So it's creating a space to do the kinds of things that, that we need to do in language instruction. Um, on the horizon, of course, are um, shared curricula. So for example, if I'm teaching, um, if during the summer we're teaching a course on um, reading German for the graduate level, it shouldn't be an issue for someone to Skype in from Berkeley who wants to take that class. And they can be either, they can actually be broadcast up here to the whole class if they want to be, or broadcast over a, um, a laptop or one of the monitors in one of the other rooms. So the idea of who's present and how they're present is really shifting. You know, people don't need to be sitting, always be sitting physically in the room. I, would, I might not want to do that for a language class where I'm teaching a communicative language, German, first year German, but when I'm teaching a, a, writing, uh, a reading class where I'm walking through a text and looking at the text, it's very, very easy for students to be teleconferenced, video conferenced in. And um, every time someone my age comes up with an idea like that, they find out that this, for the students it's just, oh, sure, what? Well, sure we could do that. I mean, why aren't you doing that? Because they're already, they're already living their lives through video conferencing. They're already telecommunicating with people. So um, we have to think carefully about the quality of the instruction and how that's happening and how that's going forward. But there are lots of ways now to share share languages, share teaching, and bring more people in. Questions thus far from anyone? One quick thing, how on earth did you connect to Steve to be able to do that? Yourself. Myself. Yeah, that was not your background. No, but you know, right. I find that teaching, that kind of teaching specifically is not, you just, that's a very small adjustment. Um, last, um, two winters ago, um, this gentleman was just asking me about, there's, there's funding called FLAS funding. It's from the um, Department of Defense. It, it, it funds learning languages, the so-called critical languages. And it's a way for graduate students learning languages like Arabic, Persian, Chinese, Korean, um, Portuguese, is a, uh, Hindi, to um, support themselves as grad students. And they can also do summer intensive language study. And there's a very kind of elaborate um, uh, it, language evaluation for the end of a teaching sequence. And so I do a lot of work in language assessment and I was going to do a workshop for all of our FLAS instructors on this campus. And there was interest in, at Yale for, the, for, a, for me to do a workshop there. And I said, you know, why do I have to go to Yale? So we did a video conference um, with, it was a bigger than just a Skype project where we had a screen with the classroom for, at Yale and Cornell and I taught the workshop to all of them. And really all you have to do is be a little bit more aware of your audience and a little bit more attuned to questions and just turn, are there any questions from our colleagues at Yale? Give them a minute. It really is not that big of an adjustment. Other questions or comments? Yes? Do you find that there's a subset of students who hunger for the interaction and that they need to take that course? Yeah, they're, they're, they're happy online. Yeah. I mean, I would never suggest that they do everything online. My, my um, contention is that there are things that are more efficiently done online so that when I bring them in, you know, I don't need to bring 15 students in the classroom and say, this is a pen, this is a book, that's a chair. You know, they, they know all that vocabulary. They come into my class and I do things with them like 
tell me what you have in your room. Now they can't do that when they're sitting in their room alone. Um, tell me what uh, you have at home. Um, talk to each other and make a list of all the things you have that's in common and all some things he has that you don't have and some things you have using vocabulary. Those are the kinds of things we, we want to be doing in our classroom in the in-class time. So it really doesn't mean um, substituting and um, substituting instruction. It means thinking more about what the most valuable and most interactive things you can do. And I would, I would suggest that goes for, um, for lectures as well. I, I would suggest if you're giving a lecture, and if your lecture can be taped and broadcast to 10,000 people, and they don't need you anymore, I don't, this is not what I want to be doing, right? I mean, I think a lecture should be interactive as well. But if there are lectures that can be um, watched by students before they come in, then think about the great interaction that can be going on after they've already seen you lecture. Yes. How does the literature of whatever kind of you're teaching fit into what you're describing? Literary texts? Yeah. Exactly. So if, if when I get into the upper levels, even in our second year, we're already teaching courses with texts, literary texts or other texts. So students are preparing those on their own, reading through them. And when they're, co they're coming into class to process those texts, either to process the content with, with me, with the group, or to process the whatever um, implicit um, information I want to get out of that text as a literary text, as a journalistic text, whatever it is. So texts still get processed and taught, but I'm not, I, 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 would, I do not sit in class and read a text. I let them do the reading on their own, maybe with guided questions or whatever, but they're coming in to do the work that they can't do without me. A colleague of mine who teaches at Brigham Young says, um, do only in the classroom that which cannot be done in any other way. All right, so it's, you're really thinking about what's the most valuable thing to do with your students in the classroom. Other questions? What yes. About you mean phonetics and pronunciation? Phonetics or? And pronunciation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's different language to language. Right. In German, we don't spend a lot of time on, on pronunciation because German is one of those languages that phonemi phonemically, graphemically is very similar. French, of course, spends more time on that. In my opinion, maybe a little too much time. A lot of that ca can be done online. There are very valuable things to do in the classroom. And uh, I think language to language, one really needs to think about what, how much needs to be done in class and how much, you know, like I said, it may take you um, 20 minutes to, in some way, master the vowels of Arabic using an online pronunciation practice. It may take someone else an hour. Here's a, here's a sort of hard question. Is there, is there becoming a native-like speaker not a requirement for Becoming a native-like speaker was never a goal in the college setting. It's never been possible. I it doesn't see. happen. If you start with beginning German at this university, you're not going to become a native-like speaker. You can be, um, what, but that's a very good question because what um, any kind of government-funded um, grants or pedagogy or any kind of projects, they're, look, they're focusing more and more on advanced proficiency, which is defined as professional working proficiency. So you should be proficient enough so that you can um, work and operate in your field in the other language. Um, that is a goal. No, please. With the reading assignment that is going on, second assignment, do you do a lot of poetry? We do some poetry, sure. I mean, that, this has been a big shift in language teaching is using a lot of authentic. You'll, you'll find, um, this is the, I actually brought the paper book. We still use the paper book. If anyone wants to make a million dollars, my, uh, you know, I, we do have an e-book. We don't like the e-book because, um, you know, accessing a book on a screen this size, you can't get at everything. Plus, I don't like students sitting in my class with a thing like this. What I, what I would like is a, a computer that, a, a tablet that you can have like this. So you can have your, your ebook, you can have one page here, and then one page where you're maybe accessing an online dictionary or whatever. But that you can also go like this, and then this becomes an, a digital keyboard, and this is, that's what I want. So anyone, that's the next project. But um, we do, ha if you look at this paper book, this is first year German, there's all kinds of literature poetry in here. It's being taught from the very, in the very first year. The emphasis is on using the poetry to 
learn the language, where of course it starts to flip as you go along, we are using the language to learn the poetry. So things kind of shift. Other questions? I'd like to walk all of, oh yes, please. The input of, pardon me? This scheme or this program that you yeah. put together. This is all coming from, from, this your experience? from my experience, but also from <coughs> the work of people doing second language pedagogy, second language research, second language acquisition. The so I'm, I'm just curious about the, the role of uh, the, the psychology of people learning. Mm -hmm. And how best to do it. They have all these whiz bang tools. Right. Right. But on a collective level, like in university or school, um, there seems to be some other dimension, mm -hmm. which maybe in particular personal fascination. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what 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 we've learned over time is that um, when someone's beginning beginning to learn a language, mm -hmm. now this is when your goal is to be able to speak, write, read, and understand the language orally. Yes. That some of the best effective, the most effective methods are when you're given a lot of input, kind of um, mirroring what happens when you're a child. You're given lots of input and chances to process that input in lots of different ways through reading, through listening, through pictures, through literature, through any kind of activity, and then you're given chances to produce output. Because when students produce out, are given chances to produce output, we see what they're actually able to do. Um, I liken it to um, learning to drive a car. You do two different things. You learn about the rules of the road, you study the book, and you take a test about the rules of the road. But I always ask, would you get into a car with someone who knew the history of cars, the name of everything on the car, and how to prepare the car? No. So when we learn how to drive, you also take them out on the road. And that's what we're doing in our language classes now. We're Right. What I'm saying is, I think the pushing in can be done sometimes very effectively outside of class. And then when they come in, I say, now sit down with your partner and ask each other about your family, your brothers and sisters, your summer vacations, and what you do on holidays. And then they get a chance to show how much they can use it. Because how many people in this room learned a language for X number of years and got to the target culture and couldn't use it? Anyone have that experience? You know, you learn and you, you thought you knew it, but you... S until the classroom stops. Right. So now we give them a chance to drive the car, as it were. But, but it, this is not saying that you don't teach and test and review. That has to, that has to very rigorously be going on, but not the other piece is letting them use the language. Yes? How do you feel about uh, ability You know, oh, AP, it's the pact with the devil. But, um, <laughs> you know, that the language, the language requirement has shifted slightly, but at, we're seeing actually um, more enrollments in second and third year classes. So to me, and I think the attitude in the colleges, the language competency requirement is the beginning. There are some students who won't take any other language, but there are a lot of students who, because of a lot of factors, including study abroad and the flag, foreign language acquisition grants, we're seeing more and more language study in the second and the third years. So to me, the requirement is a beginning. Other? Yes? Jane, you said that your goal really isn't to get them to be native speakers. Are you focusing more than on written, oral, or you know, what kind of goals would you articulate? <laughs> OK. Um, How many years do you have to do this? Yeah, OK. So there's a, there's a um, oh, we're late. Oh, no, we're not. We've got until 4.30. Um, there's a very nice scale um, by the um, federal government called the um, Federal Interlanguage Roundtable Scale, the Filer Scale, for, goes from zero to five. It's used by all the government agencies um, that teach language. Our government is the largest teacher of language in the country. I learned that when I was doing some assessment work because of the Peace Corps and the military and intelligence work. They teach many, many languages, and they do actually a pretty good job of it. And they created a scale 
in the aftermath of World War II when they need to send people over into the occupied countries and they need to be able to function there. The scale goes from zero to five. Zero is no functional proficiency. I'm a zero in Spanish. I learned Spanish in grade school and high school. I can still, um, I still know a few words. I still know a few expressions like we all do in Spanish. But if I don't get the right question, I can't give you the right answer. Level one is functional proficiency. That's what my students have at the end of one year of German. If I drop them into Germany, they can do what they need to survive. They can get a hotel room, they can ask questions, they can buy things, they can read, and these are all four skills. These are reading and writing and speaking and listening. Level two is limited working proficiency. This is the ability to work in a non-professional capacity. This is because the military needed to place people in those kinds of jobs. Level three is professional working proficiency. This is working in your profession. This is my goal for my graduate students. They need to be able to, to function in German in the profession. Level four is distinguished proficiency. These are people who can tailor language to a huge variety of formal, especially more formal presentations. Giving a talk like this is a level four activity. The, um, the poster child for level four is Henry Kissinger. Some, people, some of you are old enough to know who Henry Kissinger was, who was a level four in, in English. He was extremely proficient, obviously functioned at very, very high levels, but he would never be mistaken for a native speaker because of his accent, all right? Um, and I heard anecdotally that Henry Kissinger would say he could actually subdue his accent, but when he did that, it slowed down everything else, which is kind of interesting. Level five is the equivalent of an educated native speaker. This is somebody who is completely indistinguishable. Right. And why did the federal government need to have a level five? Yeah. Intelligence work, right. They needed to have people who could pass as educated native speakers. So this is the whole, and then you can argue that there are many native speakers who aren't formally educated, but there still are people at this end of the scale, these very, very excellent speakers. Okay, so that's the scale. It's a long scale. How do you get to be an ENS, the ENS, so-called ENS? I mean, you've got to be, you've got to live abroad. You've got to live in the culture with some, learning some language. Um, af most language majors are level two. Okay, limited working proficiency. And that's pretty good. So students exiting college as majors are level twos. This was based on a study done, really. It takes a long, but this scale, I mean, as you go up the scale, we say that the amount of language you have to master is um, exponentially bigger. There's more of it this way, and there's more of it this way. So when you're up to the educated native speaker, I mean, it's the, 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 I, mean I lived in Germany for two years, and I was probably, probably at a level four at one point, but only for about two weeks, probably, no. <laughs> because, of that, because of that specificity and the precision and the sophistication of the language. You're talking about register issues, too. So our goal really isn't level five. Our goal is probably, I mean, it's wonderful if students get to level this level two. That's, they, you can do a lot at that level. And some of them reach higher levels. They're also young. Our undergraduates are young. No, they, oh no, level two, probably takes three years of instruction and an extra an extended and, and a stay abroad. It takes a long time. Well, part of the reason I asked the question is because it's expected from North America. Mm -hmm. I was raised in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And I left high school with, I think, 27 degrees in French. And that was with a chalk and a board. And that's it. Yeah. That was the situation. Were you ever tested with an oral interview? Okay. And were you, were you able to go to France? Not during that time, no. Yeah. But it was, it, it's a difference in the accent that, that seems to me to be present. Yeah. I would beg to differ. Really? I would. I would. I've seen many, many people who felt that they were at that level and they thought their students were at that level. And when we sat down and really tested them with a, a very rigorous and reliable test, they found out that they weren't. I'm not saying that you weren't, but. No, 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 I'm just impressed. Yeah. But I, I mean, the, the expectation is, I yeah. think, is the central part. And I, I think that, well, it's, 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 a, it's a small part of the kind of program, I suppose, mm -hmm. in the, at the, the, the textbook we use at school. Mm -hmm. um, 20 years, or 30, uh, yeah. 30 years later, I went 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the same one. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, again, it's a different. It, uh, this. I mean, I ca I can't. I'll I'll never test you in French. Yeah. It takes a long time to get to those levels. Uh, this is what we see when people are actually tested with a test measuring those things. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's. Yeah. Yes. At what level would you say a translator of an art historical text? Yeah. OK. Trans from the language into English. Yeah. So translation is a specific skill. Um, we have a um, we have a graduate reading requirement on this campus, right. which is tested with a translation test, which I find unfortunate, because translation, while translation and reading skills overlap, they're not the same. And anyone who is a fluent reader of another language knows that if you sit down and try to translate that into English, it's hard and it's different. So translation is a very specific skill that maps onto reading, but has a lot to do with knowledge of the subject matter. You know, you have to know that stuff to know the, the, um, the jargon. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different skill than proficiency in the language. Not unrelated, but different. I would actually like to see a language reading requirement that, that's tested with a reading comprehension test. Because, and now with digital translation available, Students don't walk into the library and start translating, you know. They input a lot of stuff to get the meaning from the text. Do I need to use this text? This text is useful for me. Now I do a careful reading. So the process of identifying text in secondary literature has shifted with online access. Other? Does that give you a sense of being under my ownership as opposed to uh, something on the internet that you get translate and then they tell you? No. Mm, it's not really 90, it's about 40. All I'm saying is they can use those means to find out if this is a text I need to spend a lot of time reading, and then they have to do a more careful reading, and that's where they need us helping them read. Yeah, there's some really fun um, charts of people who input relatively simple sentences into an online translator and some of the stuff they get out, and those are simple things. So we're not going to be replaced by online translators. It's not going to happen. Yes? Mm -hmm. Is it your understanding that you can just glimpse into different things in those, but you won't be able to tell? Right. Because you have no idea what the other half is. Mm. Even those people who are fluent in the language. Yeah. But do you think that, that those people take uh, less time to become fluent to become as good as you could possibly be? Yeah, I mean. Um, with those, with, those tech, with those languages, you're talking about grammar translation methodologies. Right. And you can, you, can, um, you can, I think, front load someone with the skills in grammar vocabulary so that they can begin to decode texts. And then this is, it's, it's like a, almost like an interpreter. Yeah. Their knowledge of the primary material will kick in and it helps them make a more fluent understanding of that text. So we don't really think about proficiency in those languages the same way, but they do need very high levels of comprehension of, of the texts that are available to them. Oh, less than that, less than that, because you're only focusing on reading. And I mean, when we teach, we're teaching all four skills, and we're also teaching grammar. So, and there, we need to give them time practicing all four skills. So it's a much different, you know, the time we can spend on, on reading is cut down because I have to spend time on writing and speaking and listening. Yeah. 